Okay, today uh, we will discuss a new topic and this is uh, likely the last uh, subtopic in this subject of uh, fluid dynamics and this topic is basically turbulence. So, uh, turbulence is uh, not possible without viscosity. Okay, so, uh, we have to necessarily incorporate the idea that uh, fluid uh, is not ideal. That means that layers of the fluid rub against each other and there are dissipative phenomena in the fluid. So, that is one of the main causes of turbulence. So, let us try to understand what is turbulence and why it is uh, important and also extremely difficult to handle. In fact, I, before I proceed with the technical description, it is worthwhile pointing out certain uh, observations that uh, prominent physicists have made about turbulence. Uh, for example, uh, you know uh, Richard Feynman uh, in his uh, f uh, very famous and uh, much loved uh, uh, you know his series of uh, books on physics. Uh, so, he talks about uh, Feynman lectures of on physics. He says that it always bothers me. Uh, why should it take an infinite amount of logic to figure out what one tiny piece of space time is going to do? Okay, so, I mean uh, what he meant by that is that uh, it appears that turbulence is one phenomenon which is uh, which kind of uh, transcends uh, length scales and time scales. So, that means what happens at the shortest length scales influences what happens at larger length scales. That is somewhat unusual in physics and but uh, it is uh, uh, quite standard in uh, the phenomenon of turbulence and that is what uh, uh, makes it hard for uh, people to study turbulence uh, rigorously. So, let us try to understand uh, mathematically what is turbulence and how best we can go about studying it. So, the idea is that you see um, these Navier-Stokes equations and uh, the continuity equations put together uh, presumably form a complete description of the fluid. Uh, that is assuming uh, you know our continuum description of the fluid is valid at all length scales, but that may not be necessarily correct, but let us go along with that. So, if that is the case, then, uh, then you see uh, the point is that these two equations admit solutions that correspond to steady state. That means uh, that you can have a situation where the velocity distribution is independent of time and the density distribution is independent of time. So, the density of the fluid changes from point to point, but not from time to time. Similarly, the velocity of the fluid changes uh, from point to point, but it is independent of time. So, uh, such uh, distributions uh, are called steady state distributions and uh, you can always find uh, examples uh, with appropriate initial conditions and boundary conditions. You can find uh, Navier-Stokes and uh, the uh, continuity equations uh, obeying these kinds of uh, expectations. But now the question is that just because some solutions exist for these equations, it is not uh, clear that such solutions uh, are seen in nature. So, in other words, so we should really be seriously asking ourselves that do we really see velocity distributions of a fluid that change from point to point, but are strictly independent of time. So, that means if you just sit at one point, the velocity of the fluid is strictly the same at all times. So, the, the other thing is a same with the density. So, you will see that uh, that is unlikely to be true. So, uh, let me give you examples of uh, the sort of things I am talking about. Uh, so, in, uh, in Indian households, it is very common to light uh, these uh, agarbattis, so which are incense sticks. And you can see that uh, it is a very common occurrence in all the Indian households that when uh, agarbattis are lit, uh, you see a, a narrow column of smoke ascends from the uh, stick uh, upward. But if you are near the stick, that column of smoke appears uh, completely straight and vertical. But as it ascends, uh, it kind of uh, dissipates and uh, the smoke 
kind of uh, stops going straight, it starts to going in, in a haphazard way. Okay, so that is what turbulence is. Basically, it's a, so the straight smoke that emanates from the agarvati near the uh, place where it is lit, that is called laminar flow. And then later on, uh, when it uh, ascends, it's called turbulent flow. So in fact, I have a picture here. So that's what this is. So this is when it has already reached turbulence. So below this, there is this agarvati that is lit here. So you can see that, uh, so this is turbulent and this is laminar or uh, even below this is laminar, okay. So in other words, um, the, so it ascends like this laminarly and then finally it kind of uh, does that. Okay, so the point is that uh, you see uh, your um, the so so the point is that these uh, Navier Stokes and uh, the continuity equations admit solutions which correspond to this situations, this situation, namely uh, where the uh, laminar flow extends to infinity. Okay, so. Uh, so, in fact, uh, your uh, uh, Navier-Stokes and continuity equation will allow this as a possibility, but this is never seen in nature. And the question is, we have to understand why it is never seen in nature and that is because of turbulence. So, the bottom line is that just because uh, some distribution is a solution of the Navier-Stokes equation does not mean that solution is stable to perturbations. See, uh, if, if a uh, solution of Navier-Stokes equation has to be seen in nature, not just in uh, mathematical calculation. If it has to be seen in nature, it has to be stable to perturbations. That means if you change something slightly, the, the solutions uh, also should only change proportionately slightly. So if, if the solutions change drastically when you make some small changes, uh, say for example, you you just lightly blow on to the that streamline flow, uh, just very lightly blow on to it and you see the streamline flow should, uh, if it changes only slightly then, uh, then it is called stable. So the moment you blow sl slightly no matter how slight it is, if your solutions change drastically then it is called unstable. So, you will see that in many examples uh, the solutions are unstable and when uh, solutions are unstable, we say that uh, we have encountered turbulence, okay. So now how do we understand turbulence uh, mathematically? So to this, uh, to this end we have to introduce certain uh, uh, an important notion called Reynolds number. Okay, so uh, so let's read the sentence. So imagine a situation where there's an incompressible fluid of density rho and viscosity um, eta uh, flowing with a velocity uh, u past some solid of a fixed shape but variable size. So imagine there's some uh, some shape like this, and this is your size of that, uh, and there is your fluid that's flowing like that across this. Okay, so the speed of this uh, fluid is u and uh, viscosity of this fluid is eta and density is rho and uh, this is your length of the uh, that. So now uh, you can ask yourself uh, see uh, what is the, um, so one can define an, a dimensionless quantity called Reynolds number and that dimensionless quantity is defined as you multiply rho with uh, the speed of the fluid, rho is the density of the fluid and L is the length of that obstacle or the basically it is the linear dimensions of the obstacle and uh, e, uh, eta is your viscosity. So dimensionally you can verify that this is in fact a dimensionless quantity and this is called Reynolds number. So you might be wondering why did I introduce this peculiar uh, concept because uh, it seems out of the blue, I mean like it has to be motivated and you will see very soon that it has a very good reason why 
such a concept will appear in your equations, namely your Navier-Stokes equation. When you recast them in a certain way, uh, you will encounter this number naturally. So that is what I want to convince you today. Okay. So how do you do that? So first uh, let us, uh, so the first step is to um, realize that once you invoke a, a length scale like L which corresponds to the linear dimensions of an obstacle, then you have sufficient number of dimensional parameters in your uh, formalism to uh, recast all the uh, independent variables in terms of these dimensional quantities so that you can render them dimensionless. So what I mean by that is, uh, you know, suppose you have, uh, uh, you know, typically in uh, when you go to a flower market, uh, see the, uh, especially in uh, South India where you have these uh, flower sellers who are uh, sitting on the, on the footpath and they have all these flowers to sell. And you ask them, uh, you know, how much is it? They will say, you know, 10 rupees for uh, one mola, that is what we say in Kannada. So that corresponds to the uh, length from the uh, tip of your uh, finger, uh, uh, middle finger to your elbow. So basically what they have done is uh, they, have, uh, they have used uh, uh, some length of some physical object like uh, the forearm forearm length is the unit and they are expressing all other lengths in terms of the length of the forearm. So that so as a result they have rendered the length concept dimensionless. So if, if they say 5 molars, so that means it is 5 times the length of the forearm. So, uh, so you, that way you can render pretty much any dimensional quantity dimensionless by uh, writing it as the multiples of uh, you know appropriate. Uh, quantities uh, which are uh, which appear in the physical world. So if it is length, it can be the length of some physical object. So density would be uh, therefore mass per unit uh, length cubed. So length we have already defined in terms of a physical object. So then we can define mass, uh, mass also indirectly if you know the density. So that way you can uh, density of any object can be multiples of the density of the fluid. So like that you can uh, define a pretty much every, uh, so there are three independent uh, dimensional quantities length, mass and time and uh, so you have, uh, uh, you know, sufficient number of dimensional quantities to render everything else dimensionless. So given that, uh, that observation, we can go ahead and define a dimensionless quantity called R dash. So if R is the position vector of some point in space. So that position vector will have some direction and length, I mean it will have a size, the length, magnitude. So you divide by the characteristic length L of the obstacle that you are considering. So you will get a dimension less vector which is called R dash. So similarly gradient will also, the, because gradient is inversely related to length, it will have this property that it is, it will be. Uh, so it is kind of length times something inversely related to length is dimensionless. So that is what I have called as uh, uh, grad dash. So that is basically grad with respect to the R dash. So similarly with time also you can do the same thing. So if, so with time you see you, you now have another uh, dimensional quantity which is the speed of the uh, fluid flow which is U and U by L has dimensions of inverse time. So therefore T by into U by L is dimensionless. So that I have called it as T dash. So therefore D by D T dash will be similarly related to, so D by D T dash will also be dimensionless because T dash is dimensionless. So, so clearly the velocity of the fluid if, uh, if it is V, I divide by U uh, and I get a V dash which is the dimensionless version of the velocity of the fluid. So, uh, so now there are other dimensional quantities in the Navier-Stokes. So, if there are body, body forces like the weight of the fluid, so then the acceleration of due to gravity is also a dimensional quantity that appears in your equation. So, we can also render that also dimensionless uh, by multiplying by something which has dimensions of inverse uh, acceleration. So, that is basically L, L divided by U squared. 
ok. So, g times l divided by u squared is dimensionless and that we have called it as g dash. So, similarly we can define a dimensionless version of the density which we define as rho times l cubed. So, because rho is uh, mass per in this case it is uh, it's num number density not mass density is number of uh, you know whatever particles per unit volume. So, then you multiply by volume you just get a number. So, that is basically what rho dash is, is dimensionless. So, lastly you can uh, redefine pressure also to be dimensionless. So, you define p, p dash as p times something which has dimensions of pressure and then you will see that in terms of uh, these quantities it is uh, it is defined like that ok. So, having done that uh, you see this m appeared in your uh, equations also ok, it is m. So, uh, bottom line is that uh, you can uh, go ahead and uh, uh, so recast your uh, Navier-Stokes equation like this. So, so remember what that was so that uh, I should go all the way back here because I think we have come a long way. So, we have forgotten where that was and it is here this one. So, this is Navier Stokes because you see this, this tells you the rate of change of the velocity uh, and it is related to a whole bunch of forces like body force, pressure gradients, this is the uh, convective derivative and this is the viscosity here. So, now what we are doing is basically we are rewriting this in such a way that all the quantities whether it is dependent variable or independent variable they are all rendered dimensionless. So, that is what we are trying to achieve here. We are trying to convert this equation 4.136 which is Navier-Stokes equation into a form where all the variables whether it is independent or dependent variable they are all made dimensionless. So, now how do you do that? Uh, you just uh, rewrite all your rows and p's and uh, g's and in terms of the corresponding primed values and the primed values are defined like this. So, the gradients are also primed uh, expressed in terms of the primed values. So, when you do that you get uh, a, a version of Navier-Stokes equation which involves only the primes both the independent variables are prime and also the dependent variables are prime. But then now you will see that uh, this uh, when you do it this way uh, you will get an in, uh, dimension. So, clearly every term here is dimensionless including this one, but then this one is the only one which will involve viscosity and that term will actually uh, appear as 1 by R e where R e is what we have been calling Reynolds number. So, it will appear this way ok. So, R e is rho times u times l divided by eta. So, you can see that that is the reason why I invoked a Reynolds number in the beginning you would have rightly suspected or uh, you know wondered why uh, I should introduce such a arbitrary concept uh, without any motivation, but now it is uh, you can see the motivation now. Once you rewrite it uh, Navier-Stokes equation dimensionlessly it will appear naturally. So, Re Reynolds number appears naturally. So, and this is defi defined as Reynolds number ok. So, now let us go ahead and uh, uh, try to see uh, how to uh, study some. Uh, so, in other words now we, we want to analyze this equation uh, under certain limiting cases. So, so we want to consider situations where the Reynolds number is small ok. So, that corresponds to laminar flow and uh, when uh, Reynolds number is large which will correspond to turbulent flow. So, that is something we want to uh, analyze. So, we will be do doing expansions in powers of Reynolds number and we will try to see what uh, that tells us. So, there will be a leading term which corresponds to laminar flow and then successive terms will correspond to turbulent flow. So, now uh, so let us focus on examples. So, the example is that uh, let us consider a problem of uh, flow around a spherical and cylindrical obstacles. So, what we want to do is that uh, you see uh, suppose you have a sphere and you imagine that there is fluid flowing or air uh, flowing across that sphere. So, what is going to happen is that uh, the uh, 
air experiences drag uh, because of the sphere that is sitting in the middle. Alternatively, you can imagine that uh, the uh, air is still, uh, but uh, the sphere is falling in air. So, in which case the sphere will then exhibit or experience drag because it is falling through some, uh, some air which has some viscosity. So, that is what we want to uh, study. Okay. So, we want to study uh, this. Uh, so, we want to find the drag force on obstacles because of uh, turbulent or basically because of viscous fluids flowing across it. So, uh, to do that, so let us first consider this equation where we will consider steady state. Okay. So, let us consider steady state. So, if you consider steady state, you will see that uh, the, uh, so, uh, so if you look at 4.163, so let us go back to 4.163. Okay. So, what is 4.163? Basically, the Navier-Stokes. So, if you look at uh, Navier-Stokes and uh, you try to look at steady state, so that means you ignore this explicit uh, time derivative, then you will see that uh, that equation can be rewritten in this way. Okay. So, it can be rewritten in this way. So, we are ignoring body forces for now. So, there is pressure gradient, there is viscosity. Okay. So, uh, so that is the whole idea. So, you have pressure gradients and viscosity. So, you can write it like this. So, now what I am going to do is I am going to try and see if I, if I can recast this equation in terms of dimensionless quantities. So, if I do that, I can rewrite this equation in this way. So, so I told you earlier how to recast uh, equation in terms of dimensionless quantities. So, you replace a t with t dash times some appropriate dimensional quantity and so on. So, then you end up getting this equation. So, keep in mind that uh, what we are going to um, assert is the following that, uh, so there is this obstacle here. Okay and there is fluid flowing across this. The assumption is that far away from here and here far away from this obstacle, the flow is perfectly laminar and the speed is unidirectional with the velocity is unidirectional with speed uh, u. Okay. So, so, in other words, uh, if I expand v dash in powers of Reynolds number, so remember what v dash is v dash is uh, velocity measured in units of u. So, it is basically the, so it is small u times v dash is the velocity of the, the actual velocity of the fluid. So, specifically if there is no turbulence, so if there is only laminar flow, so that means the fluid is basically ignoring the presence of the obstacle, it is just pretending there is no obstacle, it is continuing along that straight line with that constant speed u. So, if Reynolds number is 0, that means basically the fluid is ignoring the obstacle. So, in which case the 0th order uh, term will clearly be uh, u hat because v dash is the dimensionless. Uh, so, v dash into u is uh, velocity. So, so, u into v dash is v. So, if uh, Reynolds number is 0, this is basically u into u cap. So, that is your velocity. So, uh, Reynolds number is 0 means uh, the, uh, the fluid is ignoring the obstacle, but in general you can expect an expansion like this. That means that you can expand a v dash in powers of Reynolds number. Okay, so, you have the 0th uh, order term proportional to Reynolds, proportional to square Reynolds like that. So, similarly uh, with uh, this also I can uh, expand. So, the ratio of pressure and density uh, when it is rendered dimensionless will also have such an expansion. So, when you uh, go ahead and substitute all that, you will get all these uh, equations. Okay. So, successively uh, uh, you will start. So, if you compare the you know coefficients of the Reynolds number on both sides, you end up getting these equations. Okay. So, uh, so, I'm, I have stopped uh, after the first term here. I mean, so, now uh, of course, uh, the, we also have to invoke the continuity equation because uh, this is uh, the other one, the Navier-Stokes 
but continuity is also important. But then continuity in the case of uh, time independent uh, situations when you have steady state. So, that is basically a statement that uh, and in, uh, we are also going to assume incompressibility that means density is strictly constant. So, if it is uh, strictly constant uh, then clearly the divergence of V is 0 we have said this many times already. So, because divergence of V is 0, so we can go ahead and uh, take divergence of this equation and uh, divergence of this equation and you will conclude that uh, del squared of uh, this p dash dash 0 is 0 and del squared of p dash dash 1 is also 0. Okay. So, I mean these are all intermediate steps in a long calculation that I am going to display now. Basically, uh, you will see that uh, the end result that we are going to obtain namely uh, one should not lose sight of uh, what we are trying to achieve and that is we are trying to find the drag force. Suppose you take a spherical object and drop it in a fluid for example, uh, it will experience some drag. So, that is called Stokes drag. And the formula for that is well known to every high school students that is uh, 6 pi eta uh, u where u is the speed of that object. So, basically it will experience uh, a drag and it has that formula which we kind of memorize in our school days and uh, just reproduce in any examination that uh, asks that question. But it is the derivation of that is quite uh, technical and that is why of course, at that level uh, nobody explains that to you. You simply ask to memorize it and accept it as a uh, given. So, uh, so this, uh, this particular course uh, kind of is meant to open your eyes to the fact that uh, those formulas that you thought were very familiar to you actually are quite technical and deep and its derivation is not that easy. So, I think that is the reason why it is worthwhile going through that derivation once so that you appreciate uh, the depth of the subject. So, that uh, formulas that are seemingly very familiar to you have a very deep uh, reasons uh, for why they are that way. Okay, uh, so, now, now that we have reached this far, we can now go ahead and apply. So, this was uh, for any shape in particular, we did not sp specifically assume sphere or anything till now, although I kept saying sphere, but uh, at the level of the equations I have not assumed as yet. Okay. So, now uh, I am going to assume sphere. Okay. So, now you imagine that uh, there is a sphere with uh, radius a uh, immersed in a fluid that has uh, some velocity uh, u at infinity. Okay. So, now clearly uh, we uh, the best uh, coordinate system is basically the spherical polar coordinates. Okay. So, that means uh, there are three types of uh, independent variables r theta and phi. So, now uh, if you think of you know what r theta and phi is, uh, it, is it is like this. So, this is your r and uh, this is your theta and this is your phi. Okay, so, so, but if, if uh, fluid is flowing like this for example, you know uh, acro across this uh, spherical obstacle, clearly things are independent of phi okay. and uh, the fluid does not you know spin around like that, it will, it will go around like this. I mean it, it does this, so it, it uh, does that but it does not do that. Okay. So, that means that uh, uh, V phi can be, uh, we can confidently set V phi to be 0. So, that the phi component of the velocity, it looks like new, uh, there is a font uh, problem there. Um, so, so th this is actually supposed to be V phi. I mean, this is there throughout the book. So, please uh, bear with me. So, it is V phi and uh, there is no change uh, relative to this azimuthal angle there. Okay. So, that is one uh, point to just keep it at the back of your head. So, basically I am just pointing out some uh, interesting useful facts that we have to keep in mind as we proceed. 
So uh, now uh, let us get to some more substantial points and that is that uh, we have to actually impose the assumptions we have made namely incompressibility. So incompressibility uh, clearly means that the divergence or the velocity is zero. Okay. So uh, the velocity field does not kind of uh, originate from some what divergence is zero means that velocity does not converge to a point and diverge from a point because see if velocity converges to a point it means that density uh, at that point keeps increasing with time. So if velocity you know diverges from point that there is some kind of a depletion at that point density uh, changes at that point. So, so the only way you can maintain constant density is by disallowing velocity to have divergence. So uh, in spherical polar coordinates divergence is 0 means uh, imposing this condition. This is uh, divergence in spherical polar coordinates. Keep in mind that V5 was 0 so that uh, the only the other two are there Vr and V uh, theta. Okay. So, uh, so it is possible to now uh, simply uh, integrate uh, this equation and uh, uh, write down the um, answer for V of r in terms of V of theta because uh, you see it is just uh, uh, it involves first derivative of uh, V of r with respect to the radial coordinate and clearly you can simply integrate and rewrite this. Okay, so uh, okay, so now what we are going to do is the following. So uh, we are going to uh, use our uh, idea that uh, uh, the angle dependence. Okay, so the angle dependence uh, of uh, of any function can be written in terms of basically a basis, and the basis we are going to select is the familiar Legendre polynomials. So, because uh, we know that uh, that is p, p of l cos theta is basically a basis for uh, any function. So, if any function of f of theta can always be written as uh, sigma l c of l p l cos theta. Okay. So, you can always rewrite this like this. So, it will have uh, all the necessary properties that you expect from something which depends on theta. So, but then I have written it uh, peculiarly like this as derivative of p l cos theta because uh, I will require it later for some other reason. Okay. So, uh, it is always possible because uh, the derivative of p l cos theta are again linear combinations of other p l's. So, which I can always rewrite that as. So, the reason why I am writing that is because I am going to exploit this identity. So, I have basically what I have done is uh, I have uh, look first I have written P v of r in terms of v of theta, but now I am going to expand v of theta in terms of uh, some uh, basis functions which is p l cos theta. In, in this particular case I have chosen some per peculiar version of that which involves the derivative with respect to p l with respect to theta, but the reason for that is because uh, I can readily uh, identify uh, the, so, in other words I can exploit this identity. Okay. So, uh, so, when I do that uh, you will see that uh, when I insert these two uh, equations here I can rewrite V of r theta like this. So, it will immediately uh, be rewritable like this. Okay. It will be rewritable in terms of these coefficients, but then keep in mind these coefficients will uh, have to necessarily be a function of r dash because uh, that was what was remaining. So, it is only the function of theta that is expressed in terms of basis. This we do not know how it looks like as of now. So, it, it continues to be something which we do not know what it is which we will finally determine. So, bottom line is you can rewrite the velocity components in terms of, uh, so the velocity components are function of two things r and theta. But now you have successfully reduced that into a function of only theta but also a function of this discrete L. So now we can go ahead and uh, also do the same for the pressure 
because uh, since del squared p is 0 I can always rewrite uh, the pressure also like this. Okay. So, now we can uh, we are equipped to uh, study what will happen uh, to the next order. So, that means that uh, so once you have written down all this expansion you can go ahead and back substitute in these equations. So, you see that there was uh, one equation which told you uh, how the first order so that means that uh, so, what is V dash 1? It is the, the turbulent part of the velocity. So, that R e 0 is the uh, laminar part of the, so this is the laminar part of the velocity. So, this is the lowest order turbulent part of the velocity. So, what this equation tells you is that uh, how does the lowest uh, turbulent part of the velocity depend upon the pressure gradients in the system. Okay. So, that is what it says. So, so now we can go ahead and uh, try to find uh, the turbulent part of the velocity by solving this equation because now we have an expansion for p uh, 0 0 also okay. so because it is uh, basically similar to that. Okay, so, uh, I will uh, I think now is a good time to stop because um, the rest of the detail is just a lot of uh, extremely tedious algebra but unfortunately necessary because uh, it is only when you go through all these steps then you get the final answer that you are familiar with from your school days and that is something I am going to display right there. Okay, It, it takes all this while to reach here. So, so eventually you are going to find that the drag is what you learned in your school days which is 6 pi eta times A is the radius of the sphere and U is the speed of the fluid in which that sphere is immersed. So, reaching this familiar result uh, from the equation of fluid dynamics is an extraordinarily tedious process and uh, it is something that you have to go through uh, in order to appreciate uh, the depth of uh, the subject because it is only when you do this then you understand uh, you know that many of the things that you thought were simple are actually not that simple. Okay, I am going to stop now and in the next class I will try to uh, highlight some salient uh, features of the remaining uh, steps in the process and then I will arrive at the uh, Stokes drag for the motion of a sphere in a fluid. So, you can actually do something similar for the motion of a cylinder in a fluid which is less familiar. Uh, and uh, I will quickly mention that and then move on to some other topic. Okay, so, thank you and hope to see you in the next class which will be the final class on fluid dynamics. Mm -hmm.